Amen. God bless everyone. Uh, what a blessing uh, it is to know that we indeed do have a friend, a friend in Jesus who has in this season of Easter and resurrection um, reminded us that all of our needs and our issues and our prayers, Jesus does indeed bear. Uh, come on, just put in the chat, I'm glad Jesus bears my burdens. Amen. Welcome uh, to Another opportunity to open up God's word. Uh, I am Pastor Mike, the lead pastor here at the Way Church, and I'm glad to get back here in the pulpit to just preach uh, this word to you on this morning. I felt compelled to certainly uh, return to the pulpit on this first Sunday of May as we are quickly wrapping up another season of Easter. Be reminded that Easter Sunday uh, is not the culmination of the celebration of the liturgical calendar uh, where we celebrate and are reminded of Easter uh, Sunday's impact. Indeed, uh, Easter is a season within the historical church uh, to give us the opportunity to reckon with what does it mean for us to have the opportunity to live as resurrected people in a time where death continues to still be all around us. I want you to know, child of God, that we do indeed have a choice. Oh, somebody ought to just say that. I have a choice. I have a choice. I have a choice to reclaim and reimagine and restore life as I have never seen it before. Uh, even in the, the backdrop of all that has happened to us, I do believe that uh, the season of Easter of resurrection is needed now more than ever before. In this way, let us turn our attention to John chapter number 15. We're going to head to John chapter number 15, and we're going to speak for a few moments um, out of the the Johannine uh, account of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Um, we are uh, aware, certainly, that uh, the book of John was uh, thought to have been written uh, by John or one of John's uh, penmen, if you will, uh, someone who was a follower in the discipleship school of John and penned his sermons and his uh, memories, his recollected accounts, eyewitness accounts, if you will, of Jesus' ministry and work as they walked alongside Jesus. I mean, whenever I preach from John, I love to uh, to to talk about even the last couple verses of the. Uh, last chapter in the book of John, I think John chapter number 21, uh, or John chapter number 20, where it says, uh, uh, no books could hold everything that Jesus uh, did or said, but these things that are captured in this book are captured so you may come to know that Jesus is the Christ. I want you to know that uh, there's enough record, if you will, for you and I to come to know through our experience and through the continued revelation of God in Christ Jesus to the world, that we do indeed have a friend and a Savior who is resurrected. And uh, my God, what a privilege it is uh, to carry everything to God in prayer. So in the book of John, we're going to spend a few moments uh, taking a, a quick look at what uh, the scriptures are attempting to teach us today. John chapter number 15, verses 1 through 11 is where we'll spend our time. So head with me, if you will, uh, and let's see what the scriptures say. John chapter 15, verse number 1 says, I am the true vine, which means that there are some false vines out here. Amen. Jesus says, I am the true vine, and my father is the vine grower. He removes every branch in me that bears no fruit, and every branch that bears fruit he prunes to make it bear more fruit. And you have already been cleansed by the word that I have spoken to you. So abide in me as I abide in you. Just as the branch cannot bear fruit by itself unless it abides in the vine. Neither can you unless you abide in me. Verse number five says, I am the vine, and you are the branches. And those who abide in me, and I in them, bear much fruit, because apart from me, you can do nothing. 
And whoever does not abide in me, Jesus continues to say, is thrown away like a branch and withers. And such branches are gathered, thrown into the fire and burned. Verse number seven. But if you abide in me and my words abide in you, ask, Lord, have mercy. Somebody say ask. Ask for whatever you wish, and it will be done for you. Verse number eight, my father is glorified by this, that you bear much fruit and become my disciples. As the father has loved me, so I have loved you, so abide in my love. And if you keep my commandments, you will abide in my love, just as I have kept my father's commandments and abide in his love. Verse 11, and I have said these things to you so that my joy, talking about the joy of the Lord, may be in you and that your joy may be complete. This is the word of God for us, the people of God. Come on, everyone. Let us say thanks be to God. Amen. Thanks be to God. So we're going to speak from uh, the topic this morning, uh, rediscovering our roots. Amen. Rediscovering our roots. Uh, Come on, bow your heads with us and let's pray. God, we just want to say thank you, Lord, for the word of God that is a lamp unto our feet and a light unto our paths. Thank you that you continue to remind us that there is indeed a great power in the word of God and in the preaching of the word and in the hearing of the word and in the doing of the word. So send your anointing that makes the preaching and the hearing and the teaching and the doing easy and we'll say thank you God in Jesus name we pray. Let the people of God say amen and a man rediscovering our roots now whenever this passage comes up for our preaching and teaching i i am always enamored by the power of connection the the kind of connection that the scriptures uh attempt to reinforce in the life and the faith of a believer when it comes to our relationship and our proximity, and dare I say, our integrating life with the eternal God who chose to make God's self known to us through the life and the ministry of Jesus. And I am one of these people who want you to remind yourself that what Jesus brings to us in an age and a season of death and 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 uh, isolation and loneliness and trouble and trauma, what Jesus offers to you and I in a immediate aftermath of uh, this liturgical uh, celebration of Resurrection Morning, what Jesus offers to you and I, even on this sacramental Sunday, the first Sunday of the month when we celebrate the Eucharist and the communion, the breaking of the bread and the drinking of the wine, which is uh, paradigmatic of the broken body and the, the shed blood of Jesus. What this gospel brings to you and I is a reminder that there is more to you and I than what we see with our naked eye. I mean, this is part and parcel, I believe, of what is at stake for us in a time when the world is seeking to uh, lead us down a path through deception and mendacity, through lies and through uh, falsehoods that rob us of our ability to both learn from the lessons of history and be open to the possibilities of a emerging future. Yes, indeed, there are times when what we can't see from the past and what we can't perceive in the future can cause us to become prisoners of the moments. And this is why I believe the 
gospel of John is such a gift to us when we look at the synoptic expressions and gifts of Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Because uh, more than any other gospel, the gospel of John is written by the apostle of John or a disciple of John who is attempting to make Jesus known based off of the questions and the critiques and the inquiries of Jesus on those who were attempting to wrestle with who he was. Indeed, there is a historical record of Jesus' life and ministry, but what John appears to have pulled together were uh, the, the memories and the experiences of Jesus that he witnessed that were in response to those who had questions. Oh, yes. Uh, John uh, is, is, is one of these passages that consistently make Jesus known uh, as the I am that I am. Because there were so many who were literally rejecting the claims of Jesus as being God made incarnate in flesh. As a matter of fact, there were some during that time who thought Jesus was only a ghost. They didn't even believe Jesus was human. <laughs> Amen. I don't know if that's where they got Casper the Friendly Ghost from, praise God. Amen. But, you know, talking about I see dead people, and they, they, they were not a fully embracing that Jesus was more than a ghost. And then there were some who were saying that he was not quite human, that he was uh, uh, something beyond that. And so uh, one of the earliest affirmations of the, the Christian faith was that Jesus was both human and divine. At the same time, Jesus carried the tug of war, the pull and the, the push of, of the divinity and the humanity all in the same container. Lord, have mercy. And, and I love how one of the Cappadocian uh, fathers said that what Christ did not assume, Christ could not redeem. That in many respects, uh, Jesus being human was necessary for all of humanity to be redeemed. That the process of our redemption, our transformation, uh, is a process the early theologians called divinization. That, that uh, Jesus became human so humans can indeed become like God. That there is so much at stake when we think of the resurrection of Jesus, the life of Jesus, that Jesus was more than just a social justice warrior. He was more than just a prophet uh, to the powers that be. He was more than just a cultural leader. He was more than Mary's little baby boy. Jesus was the eternal expression of God's fulfilled promise, breaking into the flattened lives of an oppressed and discarded people. And I want you to know, child of God, that when we come to Jesus, we are coming to Jesus as a part of the body or the scripture says the vine, the true vine, the true uh, uh, a body of Jesus that indeed has roots in the ground that go far beyond what you can see. That there is a source and there is a power and that there is a strength that emanates from our connection to Christ. And even as we are enduring these most perilous and difficult times, I want you to know, child of God, that you and I do not need to follow Jesus and uh, give up the roots that have produced us. I know that there is indeed a, a, a desire to uh, flatten Jesus as less than divine and as even perhaps more than human. But I want you to know that uh, there is a, a, a promise and a gift in the truth that Jesus, Lord have mercy, the Savior of the world, the resurrected Savior of the world has invited us into a life lived through his power and his strength. You ought to say that. I, I'm, 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 I'm discovering some roots, some connections to Jesus, perhaps, that may help my life, the, the way that I exist in a world characterized by death. Uh, I will not be a historical. 
I will not be one of these folks who are attempting to, to come into a, a walk and a talk and a relationship with Jesus that does not take seriously that when I am connected to God through the eternal power and, and, and work of Jesus Christ, how many of you know that I got I got depths that I've not reached yet. <laughs> Lord, have mercy. Oh, you ought to just tell, tell yourself, man, I, I got some depths I have not reached just yet. I know my troubles and my challenges are seeking to truncate and to shorten and to cut off. Uh, my my faith and my hope, but 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 I want you to know that there's some roots, there's some 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 connections to the eternal source that you have yet to even exhaust, and it is in this way that I want you and I to to embrace and to appreciate that the process of rediscovering our roots the roots of our faith, the roots of those practices uh, that, as the, the old saints used to say, uh, the songs that brought us over. Amen. The, 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 the hope that brought us over, the prayers that brought us over. We don't want to become a congregation or a group of followers of Jesus that, that lose the practices that brought us over. Amen. Because uh, I believe that that which is tested and tried, amen, we ought to build upon that foundation. Oh, somebody just say, I'm going to build on top of the foundation that has been set before me. And so the biblical text gives you and I great opportunities to appreciate through the imagery of the vine. The scripture says that I am the vine, Jesus says, and you are the branches, and that if you abide in me and, and, and my words abide in you, that you will bear much fruit because apart from me, you can do nothing. I love the, the words of Augustine when he speaks about this. Why? Because Augustine, uh, in a very powerful way, he's one of the African church fathers, he says, for we through praise cultivate God. And God cultivates us. But our cultivating of God does not make God better. Our cultivating is that of adoration, not of plowing. That God's cultivating of us makes us better. God's cultivating consists in getting rid of all the seeds of wickedness from our hearts. In opening our heart to the plow, as it were, of God's word in sowing in us the seeds of God's commandments and in waiting for the fruits of God's godliness. What is uh, St. Augustine saying? That if Jesus is the vine and we are the branches and God is the vine grower, that the process of our connection to the eternal one requires a, transforma a transformative journey that allows you and I along the way to be changed from who we are today to whom God would desire us to be in that great vision, if you will, when God first imagined you before you were formed in your mother's womb. Yes, child of God, I want you to know that there is a dream that God has for your life. There is a dream that God has for our world. There's a dream that God has for creation. And what sin has done, what wickedness has done, what the vices have done, what domination and colonization and white supremacy and human hierarchy and violence and death has done is attempted to dim and erase that which God created to be good. And I want you to appreciate that part of being connected to Jesus means that the life process, the lifelong process, is that of God literally pruning us, as the scripture says, uh, making us into the image and the likeness of God. Why is all this important? Well, part of why I want us to wrestle with this as we go into the rest of this text is there is a space in our lives where the process of purging, as St. Augustine says, is one that is done through the spiritual disciplines that purge us. 
And these disciplines of praise, of worship, of reading the scriptures, of fasting, of, 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 of removing those stimuli in our lives that continue to erase the divinity of God in us. All of these practices, if you will, are important for us to engage in regularly. Why? Because Augustine says these serve like a plow like a plow does in a vineyard in a vineyard or a garden a plow it pulls up all of the dirt that is hard and it 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 pulls the weeds and it gets rid of the obstructions that cause the root of the plant of the tree of the vine to get disconnected from its source and i want you to know that if there's one thing the devil wants to do in our lives is get us disconnected from our source disconnected from the roots that brought you and I over but you ought to just pat yourself on the chest and say I will not be disconnected <laughs> yes say it again I will not be disconnected so the first thing that I want you and I to wrestle with on this morning is as the scripture says I am the vine you are the branches those who abide in me and I in you, and I in them, they bear much fruit. The first thing of rediscovering our roots is we must reclaim our place. Yes, come on, just say that. I must reclaim my place. Now, the, the place that, that you and I are being asked to reclaim is a unique place that is about abiding in God. I want you to know, child of God, that there are a whole lot of places that you and I can be that will not uh, 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 catalyze our connection to God. I wish I had some honest folks that are willing to put in the chat and just confess on a Sunday morning about the places you've been in your life that, that you know they did not cultivate your connection to God. I, I, I can hear the silence in the chat already. Amen. Uh, some of us must ask God, where are you asking me to meet you? Uh, we, we got lots of meetups happening right now. Folks want to meet up at the lake for a walk and meet up in the mountains for a hike and meet up at the game and at the mall and at the store and at the restaurant and, and at the coffee house. But I wonder where was the last time you met up with God? When was the last time that you said, I'm going to reclaim the place and the space where it is set aside for me to abide in God? I mean, can you imagine what, what kind of, of, of serenity it must be to, to be perpetually abiding in God? We, we on this, this Sacramento Sunday are reminded of the, the great theological mystery of the Eucharist, of the body that, that is the bread and, 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 and the blood that is the wine and how at the words of, of our praying and our believing and our taking that the body, uh, the bread becomes the body and the wine becomes the blood, that, that there is a sacramental, a sacred and a human collapsing that, that, that these very is different uh, eons, if you will, that collapse into the grace that gives you and I strength to make it through. That in the life of the Trinity, if I can get even more theological on this morning, that, that they believe that the Father, Son, Holy Spirit exists as one God, but in a perichoresis, a, a, a interdependent relationship that is collapsed without division or tension. Lord, have mercy, that there is a place and a way for you and I to abide in God and there be no struggle. Lord, I, I, I don't know about you, but I, 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 I've had moments in my life and sometimes it's been in worship and sometimes it's been in praise and sometimes it's been in prayer. It's been in service. It's been in preaching. It's been in, in, in offering some, some, some charity to folk. It's been in marching through the streets where, where there's a moment where I experience the serenity of abiding fully in the will of God. Well, that is what the scriptures are inviting us to think about today. What does it mean for you and I to abide in Jesus? 
and conversely have Jesus abiding in you. Because when this abiding that is mutual happens, your roots begin to connect with the source, the eternal source that never runs out. And this is such an important point, dear loved ones, that that I want to ask you these quick questions. Do you and God abide in the same place? You ought to ask yourself that. Amen. I don't want you to take for granted that you and God are, are, are lockstep during this season. I want all of us to, to, to wake up day to day, not with faithlessness, not with doubt, but with a sense of curiosity and openness where you ask God, Lord, am I abiding in you today? When I go to my job, as I exist in my relationships, as I attempt to parent my children, as I attempt to be a partner to my, my spouse or to my, my family member, Lord, am I abiding in you? Am I abiding in your will? And is my abiding in you allowing my roots to go deep in, into the soil and seek the nourishment that it needs? I, I'll never forget, you know, uh, we, we in our home, we were <clears throat> having a, some issues with our pipes. And, 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 and it was such a fascinating thing because, you know, we could not understand why our pipes were, were, were backed up all the way up to the, the bathrooms in our home. And, 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 and we, we had a, a plumber come out and the plumber uh, opened up one of the, the sewage uh, uh, caps and he put a camera down there and he, he showed us on the camera that there were branches that had broken through our pipes. And, and, and they had, had, had broken through the pipes in such a way that it obstructed any of the, 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 the sewage from leaving our home into the sewer line in the street. And so he went down into uh, the ground. He had to dig about six feet deep. And when he dug up what uh, was in the ground, he pulled a pipe out and the pipe had been wrapped up all around some vines, or dare I say the vines had wrapped itself around the pipes. And he began to give me a lesson about what had happened. And he said to me that, uh, you know, Michael, what, what happened with, with your pipes is there was a small drip, a small leak in your pipes. And the, the roots underneath the ground are always looking for water. And because the, the, the soil around your pipe was always damp, the roots from your tree, from your bush, were literally seeking out, seeking out where the moisture and the liquid existed. And the, 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 the vines and the roots were so thirsty and strong at the same time. That over time, the little hole that was dripping out the water was not powerful or strong enough to keep the root from entering that small hole and busting it wide open. And I begin to think about the power of a hungry root. <laughs> Lord, help me in here today. How some of us, if we don't nourish the roots that are within us with the abiding power of God, that thirsty roots will find nourishment in deadly spaces. Lord, you ought to just say that. Uh, thirsty roots may find nourishment in deadly places. And what will happen is the roots will inhabit places it never intended or was intended to go. And it will cause damage. And I want you to know, child of God, that there is an opportunity for you and I as we re rediscover and reclaim our roots to, to do a little inquiry and ask God, Lord, are the roots in my life that are seeking out sustenance, are they finding you in the places where I abide? Yes, Lord. Because if the roots are finding the place where you and God abide, the scripture says that 
you will begin to bear fruit because the roots will bring the source and sustenance of that which is life-giving into our lives. I want to say to you, child of God, that this country right now, the roots of this country have always been rotten. And for uh, many of us, just like the, 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 the scriptural story of, 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 of Lot and Abraham, and, and, and it talked about how for many, in many situations, uh, the thing was rotten from the beginning. And the rottenness of that situation produced all kinds of death and violence. And I, I want you to know, child of God, that the soil of our country has often been so filled with the, the vices and the vileness that no wonder we're seeing the manifestation of the racist and, and, and xenophobic and, and, and dare I say, uh, antichrist behavior by many who claim to be followers of Jesus. But I want you to know that there's an opportunity for you and I to reclaim the place where these roots can find nurture and nourishment from God. The second thing that I think I want you and I to think about in this moment is that we must reimagine our ask. Verse number seven says it like this. If you abide in me and my words abide in you, ask for whatever you wish and it will be done for you. I, I'm, so, I, I'm so reminded of that scripture that, that is found in, uh, I believe, the book of uh, Ephesians. Now unto him who is able to do exceedingly and abundantly above all you can ask or think. How many of you know sometimes life has shrunk our imagination to the point where we are no longer asking God for the big things? We're asking God for the things that we could in reality do ourselves. We're asking God for uh, the, the connection, for this, this uh, opportunity, this, the, the thing that benefits just you as an individual. We're asking God for things that are too small. Amen. Because I, I don't know about you, whatever, the word whatever, in the wrong hands, in a small mind, can ask for something you could do on your own. I will not be the person who reduces my whatever to the limitation of my own imagination and mind. But I want a God-sized imagination. I want to reimagine what it means to make an ask that is bigger than my capacity to do on my own. You ought to say that, Lord, help me to reimagine my ask. Amen. Help me to reimagine my ask. Why? Because if I am abiding in God, then there is, again, an access to an imagination that is bigger than my own human instincts or thoughts. I, I can recall those moments where we were talking about reducing gun violence in our communities, and we were talking about increasing uh, access to opportunity. We were talking about launching a school. We were talking about ending mass incarceration. And I was one of these folks who always wanted to invite uh, others to dream a dream that is bigger than your capacity to do on your own. And in this moment as a church, in this moment as we're wading through coronavirus, in this moment where death is disproportionately visiting you and I, I want to invite you that we are still being asked and invited to reimagine our request to God. Because our requests to God don't have to be the things that you can do on your own, but our requests to God can be those things that we could rarely ask or think. And so, child of God, is your ass too small? What does it mean for you and I to cultivate an imagination where many can belong in the ask that we make to God. I just don't want the people who I like and the people who I love and the people who look like me and the people who believe everything I believe to be redeemed in the ask, in the whatever I ask of God. 
But I'm asking God to give me imagination to produce things that even if I am producing something that feels myopic, it has the ability to fit everyone who could benefit from the blessing of that ask. And I want you to know, child of God, that whatever you ask, when it is aligned with if you abide in me, unlocks an endless possibility. Lord, help me to, to, to remind myself, God, that my ask, when it is aligned with abiding in you, it unlocks an endless possibility. And there are some asks that I know only God can give me an answer to. There is an ask that only God can solve. There is an ask that only God can answer. And if you and I can have the imagination that is fueled by our connection to God, then I believe you can ask God for some things that folks will say, you must be crazy, but you can sit back and say, but you don't know my God. <laughs> Do I have anybody who can look back over your life and say, I asked God for some things. Uh, and although I didn't, may not have gotten what I, I asked every time, uh, I found out that the more I kept asking, uh, the more my imagination grew and the more my faith strengthened uh, to the point where I now can ask God for whatever I need. And if I am abiding in his will, God finds a way to answer my ass. Some of you think that the asking means it's correlative to what you receive. But I found I asked God for some things and God gave me what I needed. I didn't know that I needed more peace and joy. I didn't know that I needed a closed door over here because a better door was getting ready to open over there. I didn't know that that loss was needed so I can be set up for a gain. Now, I didn't know that what I needed may produce or result in some pain in the short term. But I found out that the sustainability of God's power in my life gave you and I the ability to ask the whatevers so I can check and see if I am still Abiding. The last thing that, that I'll lift up as we hasten to a conclusion this morning, what must we do to restore our joy? The scripture says that I've said these things to you so that my joy may be in you and your joy may be complete. Oh, child of God, indeed, the joy of the Lord, they say, is our strength. That's Nehemiah chapter 8, verse 10. That joy is not just the act of smiling. It is not the, the state of happiness. But joy is a perpetual flowing of, 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 of hope and strength that is infused by the Spirit of God. Joy is a fruit of the Spirit. It is an outgrowth of abiding in God. And I, I must admit, there are some times that my joy gets depleted. But I depend on the source and the connection to God through the roots of faith and the roots of salvation to restore my joy so I can store some joy for a rainy day. And I believe that there is a, 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 a way to store up some joy. There is a way to put joy in your life in such a way that you can tap into it when you are most in need of it. Uh, do I have anybody that, that can acknowledge, Lord, that I am so excited that you've given me joy like a river. I can make space for joy to exist in my life. How? By cultivating the practices that produce joy. Sometimes we think that the joy uh, is, 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 is like a zero-sum game. But I want you to know, to know that there are practices of service that, that can cultivate joy. There are practices of forgiveness that can cultivate joy. There are practices of healing that can cultivate joy. There are practices of practicing the presence of God, spiritual disciplines that can cultivate joy. Why? Because the, the practice itself is, is almost like, I don't know if you've ever 
had had Dawn soap, you know. You know, Dawn soap back in the day was was known in the commercials. You put a little Dawn in your water. Amen. It didn't take a whole lot. But but if you put a little Dawn in that water, and you just swished it around. Bubbles will start popping up everywhere. Well, I want you to know that that's sometimes how I feel like the joy of the Lord is. The, the joy of the Lord is so present in our lives that sometimes we just got to swish it around in the water of life. Amen. And, and that joy, when, when swished around, can start to reproduce itself in a way that brings more joy. If you are someone who is lacking joy, I want to tell you, put joy to work for you. Amen. That little bit of joy you have in your life, let that joy multiply itself by adding to it practices, faith, hope, love, faithfulness. Add to it and watch the joy replicate on itself. Rediscovering our roots and our faith in this moment is about you and I. Ensuring that we do not allow an ahistorical practice of Christian faith to rob us of the magnanimity, the supernatural, the transcendent call that resurrection living invites us into. That Jesus rise, rising from the dead means that you and I can rise from our dead situations, not just one time, but perpetually. That is the root of our faith, a supernatural claim on our human lives, our human exist existence, the challenges and the problems of our day. Reclaim then, child of God. Reclaim the kinds of, 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 of practices that help us ensure we are in the place where God is. Reclaim the kind of roots that seek nourishment from life-giving places and not death-dealing spaces. Ensure that we're reimagining our ask in a way that allows the whatever we ask to be in alignment with abiding in Christ. And certainly, child of God, ensure that we are restoring our joy because the joy of the Lord is our strength. Come on, let's take a few moments and let's invite the Spirit to, even as we prepare to transition to a time of sacramental Eucharistic fellowship, take a moment and just say, Lord, I want to abide in you. I want to abide in you as your word abides in me. Because if I abide in you and you abide in me, I know that the connection to the eternal source of all that is good and righteous will flow into my life, will flow into our family, will flow into our community. So God, even on this day and on this moment, may I and may we abide together. Bless, Lord, the bread that we will eat and bless the wine that we will drink. Bless the sacramental practice that we will engage in because we know that as the centuries and millennia of Christians have done it before us. We are acting as an extension of this great vine, the true vine, that we are branches of. Many different churches, many different expressions of church, many different times and time zones and and epics and eons and, and eras. Lord, all of us are one body. And you are the head. So God, in this moment, we take solace in the words that you 
told the disciples that on the night when you were betrayed, you took your disciples together in a room and you took the bread and you broke it and you said, this bread is broken for you. It is my body. And I give it to you to eat in remembrance of me. You took also the cup that was filled with wine and you blessed the cup. And you said, this cup is a new covenant I make in my blood. Drink it as often as you do this, do it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread, and often as you drink this cup, you are proclaiming the Lord's death until we come. 